Here we go. Good <laughs> evening, everybody, and welcome to this May 11th, 2020 Council Work Session. Thank you for joining us in this remote meeting format we're using in response to Governor Brown's Stay Home, Stay Safe order. This format enables City Council to meet and take care of business while keeping its members, staff, and the public safe. For work sessions like this one, where there is no opportunity for public comment, those wishing to access the meeting can do so by watching the live stream available on our website. And I'll interrupt this for a second. If you're not on mute, if you would mute, please, folks, thank you. Um, so I'll go back. Those wishing to access the meeting can do so by watching the live stream available on our website, the broadcast on Comcast channel 21, or by calling into one of the phone numbers listed for this meeting on the public webcast and meeting materials webpage. Looking ahead, tonight's regular meeting will include a public forum as well as, well, uh, will include a public forum. Sorry, this is last week's trip. Information about how to participate in this meeting is available on the public webcast and meeting materials webpage. And as always, a reminder, other avenues of communication with me and city council are available, including email and voicemail. And thank you again for joining us. And with that introduction, we are ready to begin with our first agenda item, which is a COVID-19 update on recovery. And I turn over to the manager. Thank you, Mayor. I think the recovery part of the COVID response is going to be a really long-term item, and I know we'll be uh, covering it lots of times, but tonight is an opportunity for you to start to understand how we're thinking about that. Uh, I also want to remind everybody that the emergency declaration that I have signed four times, I think, or three times, uh, lasts for two weeks, so we need to update that tonight as well. Um, the last time I know we had some questions about that and I just want to have an opportunity potentially at the end of tonight if we have time now or at 730 for you to support that should you want to and I can give more explanation but let's kick off the recovery piece because I think that'll be really helpful. All right, I'm going to jump in. Hi. Mayor, City Councilors, this is Denny Bro, Planning and Development Department. I'm joined by um, Ali Camp and Amy Bad Bradbury, better known as the A Team inside the EOC. Um, they're going to provide a little bit of an overview of some of our recovery planning work. But before we do that, I just want to kind of um, give you a little bit of kind of balcony level um, view of kind of where we are today in this planning effort and really some things that really we should all be thinking about and things that are important as we enter into these kind of uncharted recovery waters over the next months and years. Um, as you'll hear from the A-team, uh, we're in the process of creating a community recovery plan. And this is being done within the kind of EOC incident command uh, FEMA framework. Um, we call it ESF 14 in the EOC, which is emergency support function uh, 14, which is recovery. Then there's a handful of uh, recovery support functions within ESF 14 that they're going to cover here in a second. Um, but before that, again, um, I think there's some important uh, considerations regarding this kind of incident command EOC approach that we're taking for community recovery. Um, first of all, staying within this framework. Um, allows for recovery planning work and the possi possibly some of the actual recovery work to be in reimbursed. So it's important It's important that we stay true to that. I would also say that um, this FEMA recovery framework has been utilized by other communities have, as they've been recovering from disasters. Um, so it's a tried and tested um, based on experiences of cities. However, I, I think it's safe to say that cities really haven't experienced anything like what we're going through right now. So there th therefore, I think we know that our community recovery plan, it, it needs to be fluid, it needs to be adaptable, uh, needs to be flexible because there's so many unknowns. Um, we're expecting to have an initial plan uh, that work done in the very near future, but we also know that this process is gonna be iterative. We're gonna learn a lot about the impacts to our community, the economic impacts and community impacts down the road. So we'll have to continue to check back uh, in this planning work in the implementation work. 
And I know, although you know, we're all very anxious to get started with our community's recovery, um, we know that it's gonna be more like a marathon than a sprint, just like the recession that we went through. It took us a few years to, to work our way through that. The good news is we, we did recover from the recession. I think we recovered in a pretty strong way. I think we learned a lot, um, but it did take us a few years to get back to peak employment levels, if you recall. But I think comparatively, we bounced back fairly strong and we're confident that we're gonna be able to do that again in our recovery efforts. Um, we're using a framework of now, next, later, and future in our planning work at this point. And there are some basically some actions that we're taking now to address the immediate economic impacts. There's gonna be actions we'll need to take next as the economy begins to reopen. And there's, there's some longer term things that I think we may learn later uh, as the impacts continue to unfold over time. And we also just need to keep our, our eye on the long-term future as well. So that's kind of the framework of how, how we're approaching the planning. Uh, I think there's an, another important thing to recognize is the distinction between reopening and recovery. And those terms are used interchange interchangeably a lot. Um, but, and obviously there's some overlap um, because reopening is a key step in our recovery but it isn't the only thing. Again, recovery is a multi-year process, whereas reopening is something that could occur over the next several months. So we're really talking about recovery in this planning effort. Um, in addition to the recovery planning work that we're doing, there's also a team within the EOC that is, that is focusing uh, specifically on reopening. And so there'll be more information coming regarding reopening plans and guidelines and so forth. So stay tuned. Um, and although we're creating a recovery plan for, for Eugene, uh, we're also partnering with our other partners uh, in the region, uh, Lane County, Springfield. We've already started work with them. And just keep in mind that, um, you know, us developing a plan, Springfield developing a plan, Lane County de developing a plan, those will all come together and are hoping that they will have a, a more cohesive regional um, recovery plan as well. Keep in mind that for about 40% of our Eugene residents work outside of Eugene. So that regional perspective is very important. Um, and then finally, I just want to emphasize that um, suppressing the virus is really the best strategy for the health of the community and the economic recovery as well. Um, if this virus to run rampant again, following reopening and a large part of that face-to-face -face economic activity would again deteriorate, um, we would be in an even more devastating um, uh, situation with our economy and our community. So um, we have to be very thoughtful as we move forward with not only reopening, but recovery. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ali and Amy. Wonderful, thank you, Denny. Um, thanks Mayor and City Council for having us today. As Denny introduced us, uh, my name is Allie Camp and I work in PDD normally and my coworker Amy Bradbury will chime in at the later half of the presentation. To help you keep track of who's talking, we've added small photos of us to the slides so you have a face to talk to. Okay. Today we are talking about long-term community recovery. Uh, first, we'll define some shared language and identify the scope of long-term community recovery. Next, we'll discuss the roles completing this work and what areas they will focus in. And finally, we'll review the long-term community recovery process for how to create this plan. Long-term community recovery focuses on the community's health and well-being 12 to 24 months after a disaster takes place. The recovery efforts focus on the community as a whole, and we are calling this whole community recovery. There are three overall priorities during whole community recovery. To promote independence and well-being of community members, to support economic recovery, and to facilitate the restoration of systems. The scope of long-term community recovery focuses on the impacts of the disaster, and in this case, that would be the pandemic. You've likely also heard the terms response, demobilization, and reopening in addition to recovery. The graphic included on this slide describes how these pieces fit together in terms of coronavirus. Long-term community recovery is in green, response is in blue, 
and as response decreases, long-term recovery increases. Response describes the initial actions taken to an unexpected and dangerous occurrence. The goal of response is to mitigate the effects of the occurrence on the people and the environment. This is when the city's emergency operations center begins ramping up and long-term community recovery is staffed up to begin the planning efforts. You can see early in the response portion of the graph where the green and blue overlap. When response begins to decline, we see two new pieces enter the picture. They fall into this orange square. The first new piece is called demobilization. After a disaster, parts of our operations were mobilized with a specific objective. After the objective is complete, demobilization comes in with the task of putting everything back in its place, such as returning resources and people that were utilized in the emergency operations center. This step is important to acknowledge because in the case of coronavirus, there are resources out in the community being utilized to flatten the curve. The second new piece we experience in this orange square is reopening, which Denny briefly touched on earlier. We see reopening as the first step of long-term community recovery. Now with this shared language, let's move on to the who and the what. In a previous city council work session, we educated you on the structure of the emergency operations center, which includes finance, logistics, operations, and planning. The rough organizational chart on the screen shows the structure. The long-term community recovery piece falls in the planning portion of the Emergency Operations Center, shown in blue. The position that completes the long-term community recovery work is the Emergency Support Function 14, as Denny mentioned. ESF 14 is responsible for coordinating the efforts of the recovery team in order to deliver a long-term community recovery plan. The scope of this plan is to address impacts caused by coronavirus. The recovery team includes recovery support functions with specific areas of focus for whole community recovery. These areas of focus are defined in the FEMA structure for recovery. We're using the structure again because it's a tried and true framework for rebounding after a disaster. Next, I'm gonna pass it over to Amy Radbury to describe this team and their work. Uh, so when the term recovery comes up, there's a tendency to focus on economic recovery but there's more to long-term community recovery than just the economic factors. We have five recovery support functions. You'll hear these referred to as RSFs. The RSFs all tie together and support one another, and you'll see it's difficult to support one without the others. The first one I wanna talk about is health and social services. Healthcare and social services have a major impact on the ability of a community to recover from a pandemic like COVID-19. The support of health and social service programs for at-risk and vulnerable children, individuals, and families can promote a more effective and rapid recovery. Next, cult natural and cultural resources is another focus point. Uh, these resources include the city's parks and trail systems, arts and culture, and physical spaces of community gathering, education, and exercise. Support of natural and cultural resources through appropriate response and recovery will help preserve these community assets. Moving on to our infrastructure system, while our infrastructure wasn't physically damaged by COVID-19, as it may have been with a natural disaster such as an earthquake, assuring that our systems are functioning and can contribute to the long to, uh, can contribute to the needs of the community now and in the future will support a viable, sustainable community and improve the resilience to and protection from future hazards. Economic recovery, uh, the one you're probably all most familiar with, uh, the economic impacts of COVID-19 are far-reaching. Understanding how to return to economic and business activities to a state of health is essential in developing new economic and employment opportunities to result in a sustainable and economically viable community. Lastly, housing recovery. Impacts from COVID-19 on housing are unfolding differently in the case of a natural, than in the case of a natural disaster where housing is physically damaged. Our housing is an essential and complex component of recovery that will make a difference for the whole community's ability to prosper. So these RSS functions are currently working on a damage assessment in their areas of focus under the scope of impacts caused by COVID-19. We fully understand that each of these areas was not void of damage to begin with. So this scope is really important for, to help us determine the parameters of the long-term community recovery planning effort. I'll go to the next one now, thank you. Uh, so how we develop a long-term community recovery plan will be an iterative process because as we all know, the virus is setting the timeline. Our first step is the impact assessment. 
This is where we're currently at in the process. During this stage, our team of subject matter experts assess COVID impacts in, in their respective areas. This is done over a period of few days at the EOC for focused work and collaboration with other recovery support functions to determine impacts of the, for the Eugene community. This includes connecting with community, community partners, businesses, and other resources to get a clear understanding of the landscape. It also includes deeper research and data collection by our data scientists and research librarians into worldwide and national trends, as well as data analysis of available community metrics. These folks will work for a little bit longer stretches due to the nature of their work. Um, we just need them for a little longer. Uh, after the impact assessment, we'll move on to identifying actions and strategies. We'll bring together a group of employees who represent subject matter expertise in the RSF areas, as well as have an understanding of funding resources and creative problem solving abilities. This group will pick up the assessed impacts and develop a menu of potential actions the city could take to mitigate the negative impacts of COVID-19. Our previously approved plans will provide some action and strategies which may be helpful to address community needs. Once we have those options, we'll hand that menu over to the executive team to determine next steps. This process will repeat as often as necessary, allowing us to stay responsive to the needs of the community in the midst of the changing landscape we find ourselves in with COVID-19. I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Denny. Thank you, Amy. I'll just close with a couple of additional thoughts really quickly. Um, one of the things that we've been emphasizing throughout the city organization is that pretty much everything we do will play a role in the communities recover, whether it's a loan to a small business, issuing a building permit, re reopening the health center and the library, assisting renters and homeowners, stabilizing the airport, um, cultural events, recreation, uh, or continuing to invest and build our own projects, road construction projects, the riverfront park is about to start construction, park bond, bond projects, et cetera. Um, we've been very fortunate um, that we've been able to keep several projects move, moving forward. Uh, things like the Riverfront Park and Hayward Field and the Knight Campus, the Fifth Street Market, affordable housing projects. And um, I'll just take this opportunity to give a shout out to our permit staff, our inspection staff who've been showing up every day are finding innovative ways, innovative ways to keep projects in our economy moving forward. There's probably a few thousand jobs that are really attached to um, those construction projects that we've helped uh, continue to move forward. So we're very thankful for all of their work. Um, with that said, there, there's still some troubling obstacles that I think uh, will need to be over, uh, overcome as the, the community recovers. Um, some examples, um, about a quarter of the unemployment insurance claim have, claims have been in the food service and accommodations industry. Um, about a third of the workers in these industries have lost their jobs here locally. This is Lane County stats. Um, that sector makes up about 10% of our jobs in our county, and they're mostly lower wage workers, With those are the folks who are probably the most risk in our community. 22% uh, of the construction workers have been laid off. Some of those are some of our better paying jobs in the community. 14% uh, of healthcare industry folks have been laid off. 20% of arts and entertainment workers have been laid off. Um, we also have individuals and commercial tenants that are getting more and more behind on their rent. Um, we also may lose some of our uh, many cultural education entertainment events that will bring prosperity and life to the community. Think about U of O sporting events, graduations, summer musical festivals, and et cetera. Um, so there's still a lot of unknowns. Um, for example, um, I was reading today that only about 15% of uh, mall tenants are paying rent and they fear that many malls across the country are expected to either struggle or fail. And keep in mind that uh, Valley River Center is our lar largest property taxpayer. So there's just a lot of unknowns and a lot of certainty in front of us. Um, finally, I just want to touch on um, one of the primary themes that we've embraced in our community recovery planning work. And it's, it's basically confidence. Um, ultimately, I think the thing that will bring, get our community back on track is people getting back to work, um, out shopping, eating out, attending cultural events, recreating, paying rent, buying a house, supporting our local businesses, um, donating to nonprofits. Um, in order for that to happen, businesses, cities, community members, um, they'll, meet, they'll need to have the confidence that we're on the right track. Um, that not only to just get out of their homes, but to get out and to invest in our community. And because of the um, 
because of this, this investment, I think it's it's super important. And without it, it's gonna we're gonna have a hard time uh, recovering our community. Um, and when the community sees these investments moving forward, whether it's you know folks rehiring employees or getting getting a bank loan to restock their depleted inventory or building new housing or hosting a cultural event, um, they gain confidence to spend and invest. And and it's kind of like the stock market when the momentum is favorable, people are, are more likely to invest. And we're going to need that investment throughout the community in order for us to recover. Um, this was evident, I think, during the recession in Eugene, when we were very fortunate to have several key investments moving forward. We had the downtown LCC project, the Inn at the Fifth, the Com Broadway Commerce Center, the Woolworth Building, U of O was constructing. Um, that was followed by an up uh, uptick in programming and events and so forth. And I think history suggests that those were key in building momentum and the confidence that helped the community recover uh, from that deep recession. And I think we came out pretty strong. Um, so at this point, I think what we'd like to do is hear your questions or uh, maybe even more importantly, what have you been hearing uh, from community members about some of their impacts? Because we're still in the kind of the damage assessment phase. So we'd like to add that to our bank of knowledge. So thank you. Thank you uh, very much for that uh, report. I just uh, I just wanted to piggyback one thing, which is that uh, the kudos to the permit and the building industry that they've been able to keep moving as much as they have. I have a brother-in-law in Virginia who's in the construction business and he's completely shut down because in his city, the permitting office is not functioning and inspectors are not going out and doing anything. So I think it is a credit to our city that we've actually kept that industry moving along as much as we have. So uh, I have uh, Mike and then Claire in the queue. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Danny, thank you for the report. One of the things that struck me about listening to that was the depth at which staff and, and, uh, and administration have thought about the impacts on the community and the things that will need to be mitigated and the things that we can have an effect on. But there's, there's two really key things that got said that I'd want to kind of review and get back to Denny, one of the things you said was that what we absolutely don't want was any kind of um, return to any increase in cases because that would be so much dramatically worse and while I mean I'm, from a common sense perspective I understand that and I've read that many times you didn't say why and that leads into my next question. So I'm wondering if you'd be more specific there. Why is it so bad if there was a slight uptick in cases again? I guess the, um, the way that I would answer that, Councilor Clark, is um, for those businesses, for example, if they were to reopen and then uh, be forced to close again, um, the, the, the hole gets deeper. Um, you know, if they have to borrow to uh, restart, right. many, many are, um, then it's going right. to be harder. They're going to have to then maybe cycle through and yeah. do it again. And it, the whole is just going to get, or it's going to get harder to get out of that. Hole. Restaurants that have to restock all their food supply and then suddenly they can't use that. Yeah, no, I get and it. And do it all over again. I yeah. understand that. Um, the other piece was uh, the A-team did a great job. I appreciate their report. I was concerned a little bit though, because what they said at the beginning in the, in the show of flattening the curve slide that was at the very beginning, what they said was our initial goal was to mitigate the impacts to individuals and to businesses. And that was clearly not our goal with the materials that were presented to us. Our initial goal was not to swamp the healthcare system. Our initial goal was to keep this under control so that we don't end up in a position where our healthcare system is swamped and can't respond. And I think those are very, very different goals. So um, I think the negative consequences to, uh, to people's lives that come from the economic uh, uh, damage that's been done from the closing and the, the real pain that a lot of folks are in, um, the uptick in cases of domestic violence and child abuse that are are, you know have had to have happened and may not have been reported will have long lasting impacts. And I think we need to get out of this sooner than um, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a more uh, swift curve than we're planning. 
I have for a while, because I think the long-term damage will be worse. We haven't had any cases in the hospital for almost three weeks, none, zero. We have had 60 cases total in the county out of 380,000. So I, I understand our caution, but I would hate to see the cost of over caution, especially when the governor's going to open retail on Friday. Um, there'll be an announcement of that I read just a little bit earlier today. And I, I want us to focus on the right things here. So I see my time running out. I'll need a second round, please, Mark. And, if, and Denny, if you'd like to comment on that, I'd like to hear it. Um, I think when um, what Ali was referring to is our, our, our initial response was responding to the virus and the health issues not and we also were obviously responding to some of the impacts to businesses making sure employments had all the information employees had the information to get their unemployment insurance claims and all of that we're doing both but i think the primary initial focus was actually um, response to the actual virus health impacts okay uh claire Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Denny and Allie and everyone for that presentation. So um, I just have some comments and then um, a question, I think, for the city manager, city attorney. Um, so, you know, my comments are, I, I really think, I hope and will encourage us to be thinking how we incorporate our existing goals, our pre-existing goals, as it were, around housing affordability, reducing homelessness, and meeting our climate recovery goals into the work of our recovery from this pandemic. Um, and I'll admit, I, I don't have big bright ideas off the top of my head, but I think you know our collective uh, thinking and our good thinking of our staff could help us, as well as the public, um, could help us come up with some strategies that we could employ that we're not at odds um, in terms of trying to come out of this pandemic with, uh, you know, as healthy an economic picture as we can get, as well as uh, social and infrastructure and all the other things that were on that one particular slide. Um, and I do think uh, we need to get creative um, about our permitting. And so one example is, you know, thinking about how we permit restaurants and working with OLCC to access some outdoor areas around their uh, businesses, if possible. So whether that's their parking lot or adjacent sidewalk, because I think uh, if they're gonna be limited on how many people they can serve, having an outdoor place, which is much safer in terms of virus transmission, is gonna be very helpful um, to our restaurants and those who don't already have access to outdoor areas, I think we should be finding ways to support them in getting those. And I think we could apply that kind of thinking to other impacted industries, movie and live theater venues, concert venues, our smaller retail shops um, are all going to need help in uh, figuring out ways they can surmount the need for social distancing and keep safe and bring their business back online. Um, and then I received at least one email from a community member basically asking us to require people to start wearing masks. Um, and I know that the governor's order doesn't say we're all required to wear masks. Um, and I'm not even sure I would want us to do that, but I do want to know what authority we might have to do that. And there might be a time during this transition and reopening that the public will want us to do that or more members of the public or that public health might strongly recommend it for venues such as movie theaters if they want to reopen. So I'm just wondering if the city attorney or city manager um, could let us know, you know, if that's something we could do as a city, just even in theory. <laughs> we're gonna, <laughs> look, we're gonna stare that. each other down through, <laughs> through Zoom. I don't have my emergency order sitting right in front of me. I'm going to pull it up. It's probably in my bag right here. That's to what know I whether it gives the authority for um, for having everybody wear it. I know I've been touching base with each jurisdiction. So Lane County, Springfield, EWEB, 
um, LCOG, LTD, and just t checking in on like what they're just, what each individual is doing as an employer. And it's pretty, uh, there's a lot of variability even just across that spectrum. So it, it, it could be a challenge to get the whole city to comply. Um, so when it, if the question is for council, I mean, you still have your standard police powers um, to adopt an ordinance, even if it was an uncodified ordinance that basically passed a law saying you can't be in these places. So you could follow your standard, um, I would have to have a public hearing, but you could do though, your kind of your standard police power regulation, even if it was just for a short period of time. So that's always available to you as a governing body. For Sarah, the um, under the emergency declaration, she does have the authority to prohibit or limit the number of persons who may gather or congregate upon any public street, public place, or any outdoor place. Um, that could be potentially used to say you can't congregate there unless you're wearing a face mask. So there are ways, there's not something that's, you know, perfect for just you got to wear this, but there are that one and um, there's just certain areas it, that you can order evacuation of certain places. So the cleaner authority is if the council was interested in doing to, to follow your regular regulation authority. Um, and then if there was a desire to try to do it through the emergency declaration, we could look closer at that. Great, thanks. And I'm not recommending that right now. I just think it's good for us to kind of know what is, is the legal landscape in case that became an issue in the future. Thanks, Mayor. Can I, can I just add really quickly that I mentioned that we have a reopening team within the EOC and a lot of the issues, Councilor Sarep, that you mentioned are already being worked on uh, with that team and it's not, it's part of recovery, but it is not the recovery work. So, you know, outdoor seating for restaurants and all those things are already on their list and they're already working on those kinds of things. But, and so you'll, you'll, you'll hear some of those things in the near future as part of the reopening effort. Okay, I, I know that Mike wants a second round, but anyone who hasn't had a first round want to raise a hand? Okay, Mike, you get a second round. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I just want to say that I, I appreciate staff's focus and I like the report and I like the depth of the things that they're looking at. I, I think that a lot of people have an, a lot of issues that they will turn to the city and ask for help with. So that's what their work is really amazing. And I think that the way the staff have handled this all the way through has been very admirable. I, I really appreciate that. Um, but I would hope that we could turn focus to how do we, how do we within the framework of the governor's orders and within the framework of what the county is applying to the state to be able to manage at the county level, how do we create a framework where we open as quickly as possible while staying within the bounds of safety? Um, I, I think we're going to mitigate an awful lot of damage that we'll be dealing with for a very long time. If our, if our real focus is how do we open as quickly as humanly possible so long as it is reasonably safe? And, and I'd love to hear Sarah's thoughts about that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, I appreciate that. And, you know, Lane County applied to be in the first wave of counties that get reopened. So we'll hopefully hear soon about whether we'll open on May 15th. And I think that's been part of our plan is even phase one is, um, and I'd go back through and read all the details because it does change with some regularity, but under phase one, they're still encouraging anybody that can telework to telework. So under phase one, we'll still be uh, asking our employees that are able to provide services from home to do that. So in terms of our own opening, we'll be following the county guidelines and the state guidelines. I know everybody's really eager to open up and get things going. And I think we're ready to support the business community. I get emails and texts, phone calls pretty regularly about, uh, in fact, on Friday about the issue counselor Syrett brought up. So I think we're we're prepared to support that, but I think um, we'll be following the state and the county and not getting ahead of that. 
Well, I can I can see several of my colleagues nodding their heads. That's the great thing about this Brady Bunch format here. That's awesome. Um, but I would say, um, I, as I have said before, I hope we would do this based on facts and based on data rather than based on fear. And it seems to me like we're doing this based on fear of what may happen rather than looking at the facts and the data of what have happened from a harm perspective. And I think as we go on, the longer we stay shut like this, our, our emphasis to be overly careful will have negative effects that we're not measuring. And I think it will be less dangerous for us to open as quickly as it is safe to do so rather than to wait. So I, I'd urge you to give that serious consideration. Yeah. So I guess I wanna understand that a little bit. So sorry to belabor this, but- No, it's all right. You know, we, I think we're, we should talk um, about this. I do. We are, you know, we're following the executive order from the governor and Lane County. So are you suggesting we should be jumping that? No, or are you we saying should be just right be ready top. as soon as we can? Right. Yeah, we should be ready as soon as, possible. And frankly, I would if it wouldn't cause political problems, but it's silly to do. Um, I, I think if you look at the case by case analysis of county by county, ours has been safer and less affected than almost any other statewide, um, other than the eastern part of the state. Yeah, but certainly within the Willamette Valley, we're somewhat geographically isolated. Obviously, there are people coming in and out, but the level of safety that's already prevalent for us is higher than it is for others. And thus we are at less risk and the consequences of us continuing in the, in the pattern we're in will have much in, in my opinion, will have much more long-term harm than us being overly careful. I, I just would caution okay. us against being overly careful. Thank you for clarifying that. And I use the word careful, you know, advisedly. I mean, what I, what I mean is for us being overly cautious, it's not being careful if we end up causing greater harm by being overly cautious, and that's what concerns me. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, uh, and then Claire again. I'm going to just jump in for one second because one of the things that I've heard a lot from the business community is an anxiety about an uncertain landscape for reopening. So I think, you know, there's there's speed, but part of it is right to be sure that we're clear enough with them because they're concerned about their employee safety, they're concerned about customer safety and how they assure that. So I don't, and you know, it kind of segues, it connects with Clara's questions about masks. Like if, if people are wearing more masks, would it be then a little bit safer to open up retail? I mean, is that is that a balancing act we want to do? So um, thank you. I now, Alan, and then Claire for a second round. Yeah, Mayor Mike, question is along the same lines of what you had um, one point first is that if history tells us anything sometimes and often the second round of things like this is worse than the first round and we're already hearing about mutations of COVID-19 and it scares me uh, and I also fully um, appreciate people's need and, and desire I had the same uh, desire to open up as quickly as possible as long as we're safe and and wanting to get the economy back going again and get people paychecks and and be able to alleviate that type of anxiety about what's happening in the future with regard to their their finances um, but one of the things that we've seen already in the last couple of weeks is when states and other locales opened up People, there was a burst of, of uh, pent up uh, desire to, to go out and do things and they violated every single rule in some cases um, about social distancing and uh, all sorts of things. And we do hear a lot of anxiety about uh, people who work at the mall and if they're gonna open the mall, I have to see these people every single day, hundreds of them and they're, and they're all in my face. And How's this all gonna work? And I'm, I'm uh, the question I have is, how are we going to address the issue of uh, opening up and being safe and and not having all of the learnings that we've had and all the rules that we've established just go flying out the window? Uh, 
I think that's why we're working so closely. I think Chief Heppel might be on here, but why we're working so closely with our regional partners to make sure that we're all kind of taking steps together, watching the data together, adjusting as quickly as we can together um, while keeping it safe. Because we're still in the emergency response, flattening the curve is still uh, the job of this portion of the response. Yeah, and, and teeing off of what, and if, if the chief's on, that would be great. But teeing off of something that Claire said, we aren't very far from counties that haven't put in a plan, uh, just to the north of us, for instance, and, and what prevents all those people from coming down here because we're now open uh, and not abiding by the rules uh, of what's safe. Yeah, Councillor uh, Chief Heppel, I, I understand uh, your concern for sure. And I think uh, that's one of the challenges that the state is also dealing with and that, um, you know, one of the things I said from the beginning, this is a, this is a behavior thing, right? So the, the two primary ways that we can control this is, well, we have all the, the, the things in place. Is it still physical distancing, right? And hygiene. And so um, yeah. those will continue to be a problem um, as people start to intermingle and congregate again. And that's why part of the plans is the is is the limitations of those things. You know, with with phase one, it's you know twenty five, and phase two, we may see a larger number with that. I think that also might be a contributing factor as to why um, the Oregon Health Authority and the governor's office elected initially our phases were going to be in two weeks, and we extend those out to three weeks. So it gives us a little bit bigger window to see what the impact was. I I think it's that classic case of when we do a little bit of research. Um, so we, we set our parameters and then we put in an input and we stop to see what the change was. Um, we put in an input, stop, see what the change was. And that's the walking down the hill or that research process that um, I see is being developed, um, not with just the OHA plan and the governor's office, but also here in the county um, with the blueprint. Right. So it's not just three weeks later, we go into phase two. It's we look at it and, and, and figure it out as we go. And it could be four, could be five, could be six weeks, uh, depending on how, how people react to it and what's happening on, in, on the ground, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I also wanted to concur with uh, looking at requiring face masks, see if that's something that we can do. Um, I understand that's not part of, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand that's not part of what the governor is saying in phase one. So there's a strong emphasis on their utilizations, but I believe you're correct, there is no specific mandate. Yeah, and I guess, you know, one of the things about that is what happens if somebody doesn't do it and they're, they're, and they're asked by uh, a person of authority to put on a mask and they refuse, what happens then? That's something, yeah, this, I don't need an answer for that, but yeah, that's yeah. something we need to we'll think about and be prepared for. I think some jurisdictions that we're seeing, um, not everybody got the memo about let's be let's be uh, civil and kind and and uh, and get people to behave. But okay, I'm going to let uh, Chris jump in have the first round and then Claire. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to respond to the notion of the face mask question. Um, I think it could be challenging. Um, in a number of ways. One is if you require everyone to wear a face mask, uh, where's the enforcement? It's like fireworks. I mean, how do you enforce a, a law that you make? Uh, is the, are the police going to drive around town making sure everybody's wearing a mask? Um, one thing you could do is you could tell businesses that they cannot admit anyone to their business unless they are wearing a mask. Um, that would be the only way you could try to approach this question. Um, but there have been other places where um, I just was reading in the paper, uh, a security person was shot because they required somebody to wear a mask before they could go into uh, the dollar store. Um, I don't want to create those kind of confrontations. The wearing or not wearing of masks pathetically has become a political issue and that you are expressing your politics now by whether or not you wear a mask. And I don't want to go down that road because that road has potential to be very dangerous. So um, I think if we want to do some kind of mandate around masks, uh, we need to think very carefully about what the follow-on repercussions or consequences may be. 
Um, I think I think it's worth a conversation. Um, I I'm I wish more people would wear masks, but I don't know how we could enforce wearing masks any more than we can enforce our fireworks restrictions, which we all want to have. But we still have illegal fireworks. We'll still have this. So um, let's talk about it. But let's talk about it realistically in terms of what we actually have the resources uh, to to do and enforce. I guess I also just want to mention part of the reason why there's been sort of this delay in the mask piece, even internally in terms of what we should do as a city organization, is at the beginning of this, we were so taxed on the PPE and we didn't, you know, it was really like save it for the first responders. Kind of moved into this new place of being able to use cloth masks and it being more about being public protective equipment than personal protective equipment. And so that changes it a bit, but there's still, I still, maintain a concern that if we put out something broadband that we have a surge of people buying up all the PPE. So that's something that I just think Chris and uh, Karen Gaffney and others that are working on that should should work through too. Okay, uh, Claire. Thank you. Um, so yeah, just to be clear, I'm not advocating that we pass a law that makes wearing masks mandatory. I appreciate the discussion. I would much prefer that it just become a social norm that we support and encourage and um, that it's not a law. Um, and I also think it's much more critical for indoors activities rather than outdoors. The science has really shown that, you know, airflow and shared air is kind of part of the challenge and that outdoors, it's um, particularly if you're staying away from each other, um, there's really not the same uh, level of risk. But I also wanted to respond um, you know, to the idea that because we've kept our caseloads down that we're not as, as much risk as other counties for surge. I, there is no evidence that the fact that we've kept our cases from escalating that we're at less risk. Um, there have been no doubt uh, dozens of cases that have not been reported um, in our county. I know of at least three uh, healthcare professionals who uh, almost definitely came down with this and in two cases did, um, but never were able to get tested. And so they are not part of our official statistics of how many people um, got COVID. And I'm sure there are many other people out there uh, similarly and other people who had it, who had zero symptoms and never knew they had it. So I, I really think we must be cautious because we can predict with much certainty that people will die unnecessarily if we are not. Okay, I am, uh, Emily, do you wanna put a motion on the table about extending the uh, city manager's emergency declaration? You're on mute. On, off, on, off. <laughs> um, I didn't print the email of the text. Can I just move that we extend the state of emergency, city of emergency declaration? Yes, it would be, the, the motion would be to support the city manager extending the. I um, move that we support the city manager in the declaration of emergency. Second. By two weeks. Okay. Any any need a discussion around that, um, Mike? Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> First, I want to say, I to my friend Claire that um, I, I have tried to make that point previously that if you extrapolate the number of people that have been tested and then the number that were positive and say if that were similar in the community, it means four or five thousand people have had this. And we have experienced two people that died from it, unfortunately. But in 2016 and 17, dozens and dozens and dozens of people in Lane County died from the flu. And we didn't have similar effects of, of how we dealt with it. And so it's one or the other. Lots of people have had it or they haven't. And either way, 
you make that argument. I don't believe the statistics bear out that it is as great a danger for us. Um, the, the reason that I'll be voting no on this isn't ha, doesn't have any reflection on Sarah, and I want to make that perfectly clear. I'm going to vote no on this, but I think Sarah and the staff have done an amazing job. But I don't think that the, that the statistics bear out that we are currently in an emergency, so I'm going to vote no. And by the way, I'll support anybody who wants to make a motion about testing, which I've heard Councillor Semple speak about quite a bit. And I think that's the only way to be certain. And we really ought to be doing it in new and much more intelligent ways like she has suggested. So, yeah. Okay. I just wanted to mention that uh, two quick things that the governor extended the, her emergency declaration through July 6th. And I believe the county is taking action tomorrow yeah. to extend through July 15th. And, um, you know, it is still an emergency, it's a still a level three emergency. And it's not just at this point about the health piece, it is still also about the um, economic piece and making sure that we're moving forward as fast as we can. So I just, um, I feel like it keeps us in the best, con also in the best position to receive funds from FEMA, should we be able to be reimbursed from any of this. So I get the voting no and, and wanting to move faster, but that's, going to be the reason why I will continue to bring it back. Okay, everybody ready to vote? All in favor, please raise your hand literally or figuratively. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. In favor, opposed, one, and it passes. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for those reports and for that discussion. And with that, we are ready to go on to our second item for the night, the review of the 2019 implementation of bond measure to fix streets and the 2020 pavement management report. I just saw Katie light up, so okay. I'm gonna just turn it right over. Well, thank you, Mayor and Council. I'm happy to be here and thank you for having me. Um, my name's Katie Marwitz and I'm AIC as a principal civil engineer in public works engineering so tonight I'm going to be presenting the review of implementation of the bond measure to fix streets for 2019 and also giving you an overview of the 2020 pavement management report. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. At least I think I am. Okay, I would first like to start out with a little bit of an overview of what I'm going to be presenting today. So first, like I said, I'm going to be reviewing or presenting the 2020 annual pavement management report. And then I'm going to be giving you information about the 2019 street bond report, including some information on our street repair panel, um, some information about the auditor's report, and then I also want to include some information about looking ahead about what we're doing in public works engineering this year in 2020 and also for the future. So I want to start out with the 2020 pavement management report. So the pavement management report comes from is an output of our pavement management system itself. And that system is housed and managed out at public works maintenance under Eric Johnson and Nico Quinn. So really this is an annual report that gives us a snapshot of what we should expect in 2020 in terms of the condition of our streets and the condition of our, you know, our critical infrastructure. So this slide is an overview of our, of our Eugene system. As you know, we have about 1,350 lane miles of streets in town and also just under 50 center line miles of off street shared use paths. And when we're evaluating this, we evaluate our arterials and collectors, which are our larger streets. Um, those are evaluated annually. Our residential streets, who so are slower, our smaller, our local streets are evaluated every three years. And then our off-street path system, they're evaluated every other year. And when I talk about those streets actually being evaluated, what that means is that we have people that go out and rate the pavement. So they are boots on the ground, they are out documenting distresses. Um, what they're doing is they're identifying the distresses in the road, they're categorizing the type and the amount of distress. And then that entered into the pavement management system 
and identifies a need, like what is our need for this year in terms of rehabilitation of our streets? And then when, when we compare that to what our budget is for maintaining and rehabbing streets, that difference is the backlog. So in terms of backlog, I'm gonna give a little bit of a little bit of background on where we are and where how we got here. So looking back, we know that in 2007, our backlog was projected to reach $282 million by um, 2016. And then in 2008, the backlog was estimated at $171 million. We know that in 2008, we had our first of three bond measures, we're on our third now. So we had our 2008 and our 2012 bond measures. But based on our 2019 data and the bond renewal, the current backlog is estimated to be about $76.3 million. And that is up just a little bit from 2019. And I can talk more about that increase in just a minute. But based on the projected funding, when the bond funding is complete, um, it's still estimated that the backlog could reach up to $242 million again in 10 years. So I want to talk a little bit more about the backlog and the gap. Um, it's estimated that on 2019 data, really $15.3 million is the figure that's needed to fully fund the program and to eliminate the reconstruct the backlog of reconstructs in the next 10 years. But locally, currently, our um, funding is about $12 million. We're about eight to $9 million in bond funding a year, and then we're about $3 million a year in local gas tax. So the difference between the 15.3 and the 12 is where we get that gap. And so from this presentation that you've seen for lots of years now, we know that that gap is there and we know that that gap will continue to grow. And that's what's causing one of the factors that's causing the backlog to go up just a little bit as well as um, increased construction costs. So one of the things that I wanted to touch on when we're talking about this backlog and funding for the bond is that really payment preservation is an ongoing need, right? Streets rehabbed in the first bond measure way back in 2008, especially our larger streets, will soon again need treatment. And so that's something that we need to continue to address. So it's not, um, not a matter of someday getting to zero. This is something that our infrastructure will continually need to be addressed to maintain a well-functioning system. And before I go on, I did want to point out um, that we know that there is going to be impacts likely to our local gas revenue upcoming um, and because of the COVID situation. So we don't have really good data right now on what the impacts of that will be. Um, but we have received information from the state and we know that there'll be impacts. So uh, we will plan for that in our payment preservation program itself. Um, and typically year to year, we program at the high level. So at the program level, we program in some contingency so that we have some flexibility as needs change um, in this project and funding fluctuates. So in the next year or two, we'll just have to be flexible once we know and have an idea of what the size of that impact will be from the current COVID situation. So next, I wanna talk about the current bond measure. So the 2017 street repair bond was passed in November of 2017. I mean, it follows the 2008 and the 2012 bond measure. So it's $51.2 million to fund street preservation and active transportation projects and includes a million dollars on average per year for active transportation. And the first year of the construction of this bond happened this last year in 2019. So when the measure was put to ballot and included the resolution of 5204 from council that required the formation of our citizen street repair review panel um, and that follows the suit of the 2008 and 2012 bond measures. And really, as staff, we feel that the transparency and reporting is really a key piece of this and help building trust and confidence in this process that we continually, continually move forward. So as part of that SRP group, they provide an annual report and about documenting the use of the bond proceeds. And then it also includes a report from an outside auditor to talk about the bond expenditures and both of those pieces are inclu were included in your agenda materials. So our 
2019 SRRP group consisted of um, nine community members. And we typically meet three times a year. We start in the fall when we do an on-street tour. We take a small bus and travel around Eugene and on this kind of rotating cycle where we look at projects that have just been completed and also then preview the projects that are upcoming. We meet three times a year. And really as a staff, we really appreciate the engagement and the really diverse opinions and inputs from the SRP. They're very valuable. So next I wanna jump into the 2019 projects themselves. So this is a map of all of the projects that we plan to construct in 2019. I do wanna add, so this is um, in public works engineering, this was all the projects. This is not just bond projects, but we did work as you can see all over town. So the 2019 projects, we had seven projects, seven contracts that rehabilitated 24 streets last year, and that's nearly 20 lane miles of roadway that was rehabilitated. So we included, included active transportation elements like enhanced pedestrian crossings and improved bike facilities where we can. And the first standalone project for the active transportation money is going to happen this year in 2020 with the rehabilitation of the West Bank Path. And then we also continue to um, include in our work, uh, we try to look for ways to include more sustainable practices and materials, including in-place recycling and then the use of warm mix asphalt. So on the screen here, you're gonna see an expert excerpt from the cover letter from the SRP to the city manager, which is included in materials. And I'm gonna read you the quotes. Based on this limited review and all materials presented to us, we unanimously conclude that the bond proceeds were used for the authorized purposes and in compliance with the limitations and restrictions outlined in the council resolution. The second quote is, we believe the community is getting a good return for its investment in street repairs and the bond funds are being used wisely to meet the objectives of ballot measure 20-275. And as I mentioned earlier, we also include a, an independent auditor's report in our annual reporting, which is at the back of the SRP report that you have. And a quote from that report is, all tested expenditures were supported by proper documentation, such as vendor invoices, certifications of payment, payroll records, signed contracts, and or photographs of the work in progress. All tested expenditures were recorded in the proper account, fund, and period and were spent on street projects included in Exhibit A of Council Resolution number 5204 or other street preservation projects approved by City Council as permitted under Resolution 5204. No exceptions were noted. So before moving on into talking about 2020 and the work that's currently underway, I wanted to circle back to the conclusion of the 2012 bond measure and last year's presentation um, on this topic. So like 2008, the 2012, at the end of the 2012 bond measure, we anticipated that some additional funds would be available. And during this presentation last year, we came to you and received your approval for the addition of six projects to be added to the 2012 bond measure. All six of those projects were completed in 2019 and anything, any costs that went over the allotted bond funding was covered by our gas tax funding. And in addition to those six projects, we were able to uh, more fully fund the upcoming ex extensive um, South Willamette improvements. So as I conclude reporting on 2019, I'd like to jump into talking about what we're currently working on in 2020. And really we appreciate the coordination between our departments um, and the group effort to continue supporting the local economy through the projects that we do in our current situation and into the future. We've worked really extensively on logistics, really logistics of bidding. How do we bid and accept bids? And then also logistics of keeping, um, keeping our work site safe, keeping our staff safe, keeping the community safe around it, and then also keeping our contractors safety, safe that are doing the work. So next I wanna jump into 2020 and what we're doing is public works engineering. Now, I, my perspective is from public works engineering, but I know as I talked about those other departments, they have other similar, um, similar work plans continuing. 
So we have a number of, of contracts and projects that are already in constructive, actively constructing right now, or where contracts have been issued and signed. And that's, so we already have 10 projects going for the year for about just over $13 million. And then we have a number of projects remaining to be advertised or awarded this year. Um, that's 16, 16 remaining projects for a total of about $7 million. And if the council decides to move ahead with the riverfront infrastructure, um, that total for remaining projects will jump to about $16 million worth of work. So before I move on, I wanted to talk about a shift. Um, with the shift in the large scale events at Hayward Field, we have had to go back to the real high level and shift and look at how our program is sequenced. When we passed this uh, 2017 bond measure and then the development of the 2021 events, uh, we intentionally scheduled our projects away from the downtown core so as not to overlap um, with the 2021 events. But with that shifted, we are also needing to make some shifts in our project schedules moving forward. And because it typically takes two to three years for us to go through public engagement, testing, utility work, and design, um, it's very difficult for us to move projects forward a year, and some projects will have to be shifted a year. And so while the collection of the funding of the bond will still continue and conclude in 2023, we anticipate that the projects themselves, there will be some that won't be finished until 2024. So as I conclude, I wanted to put this list up on the screen for you. It's a visual presentation of what we're planning on co um, constructing this year from the public works engineering standpoint. Now, while it's small font on the screen, um, what my intention in showing it to you is really the scale, the scale of what we're planning to do this year and the, the scale of what we're intending to put out for construction and continue to do work this year and as we still move forward and want to be a part of um, the economic recovery of our area. And with that, I am happy to take your questions and thank you for your time. Now I've got it. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for that report. I have two counselors in the queue, Mike and then Chris. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Katie, thank you for that report. Um, that was thorough and exceptional. And I appreciate the fact that I, I think our staff has done such a good job and the, and the volunteers who were involved in the monitoring of all of that and the over the course of time, I think we, we made a promise and we kept it and doing good work in this regard. So thank you very much for managing that so well. Um, my question is around some of the comments you made at the first part of that presentation about some of the early major thoroughfares that we're going to have to revisit again soon. Right. Um, so I'm going to ask you to answer a hypothetical situation and kind of extrapolate here a little bit. So would you say that our streets, because it, those numbers have begun to rise a bit and I get that there are several reasons for that. I get that the, you know, um, flattening of the gas tax revenues and there's a, there's a lot of reasons why though that imbalance doesn't just go straight down, it goes down and goes up a little bit and then it goes down and then it may go up again. But would you say one of the contributing factors is that our streets wear out faster than other cities our side in the western size in the western United States? Mm, I would I would not say I no that doesn't match my understanding and my experience of other areas. Um, I think that one of the we've talked about a lot of the contributing factors, and when we talked about roadways that will need work again, those are really our larger streets, um, our larger streets like a West Eleventh or a Coburg Road right. or a River Road. Um, those we program kind of on a, a 12 to 15 to 20 year cycle um, just because of the amount of use that they get. But certainly when we come back around to those streets, because we've um, increased our funding over time and gotten so much good work done, the treatment in the future ideally will be a lot less than it was the first time. You know, sure. things that we did as reconstructs early on, we continue to have um, 
stable stable funding, then in the future, ideally, those will be rehabs, which will be significantly less expensive. Would you so you wouldn't say that we have um, on those major thoroughfares roads that need expensive or need more um, maintenance than other communities experience? That that's correct. Yeah, I think we do a really good job of designing and building our roads in a in a way where we know we have the future in mind so that we can continue to come back and rehab them in a really cost-effective way. Although construction is still expensive in here. Sure it is. Well, and the larger point I'm driving at is we as a council decided to downgrade our, um, I don't even know what to call it. I, we don't, without Rob here, I don't know how to uh, define this well, but uh, the, the classification of our street congestion and our street use from a D level to an E level and thus saying essentially to our community, get used to it, it's gonna be more crowded. Mm -hmm. Would you say that, and, and so you wouldn't say that that increased use and lack of uh, uh, relative uh, capacity has an impact? Well, certainly I think the use and the amount of vehicle trips we get on a roadway um, affects, the, affects the roadway. Um, we certainly see it in areas where we have the higher, the higher um, the higher trips, the heavier vehicles wear out sooner. But as far as the classification, and that's not something I can really speak to. I think Rob, Rob is way more of a subject matter expert on that. But you don't think we experience a higher degree of degradation than other communities our size in the West because of our higher density of traffic? No, I think that we do a really great job of managing our street system and our pavements. Excellent, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, Chris. Thank you. Um, when Alan and I first served on the uh, pavement committee back in 2007, um, that's when we first heard that the projection for the backlog was going to be $280 million if we, if we didn't do something about it. But the conversation talked about the backlog, but it very consciously said there was also a maintenance problem. The year to year maintenance is one issue that you have to have money for that every year. And the backlog was another issue. And we took very positive, this bond is a good example, steps to deal with the backlog issue, but we still haven't adequately addressed the yearly maintenance issue. And if we don't deal with the yearly maintenance issue, then streets fall into the backlog and it starts to go back up again. So, and I had long conversations with Kurt Corey about this was, what can we do to stabilize the yearly maintenance so we don't keep falling into the backlog? We came up with, I think it was five, um, proposals for how we could deal not only with the backlog but also with the maintenance side and the council only chose to implement two of them uh, because the other three were not popular people didn't like them but I think part of the reason why we we dealt with the curve but it's now starting to go back up is we haven't dealt adequately with the year-to-year -year maintenance that 15 million dollars we've got to come up with every single year to keep streets from falling into that other category. And we can pass bond measures and that'll deal with the backlog and we'll try to chip away at that. But as long as we have this issue, we're gonna, we're, it's never gonna get solved. So I think we need to consider the fact that bond measures and a gas tax by themselves are not gonna dig us out of this hole. They'll deal with the backlog to some degree. They're not gonna really deal with the yearly maintenance issue we've got to deal with the yearly maintenance issue as well as the backlog, uh, or we're just gonna be kicking the can down the road as previous councils had done. And we said, we didn't wanna do that anymore. So I love your uh, report on the use of the bond money. It says we've done an incredible job with the bond money. I really appreciate what you've tried to do with what maintenance money we give you, but we really have to have a serious conversation about what we're gonna do to stabilize not only the backlog, but to really provide an adequate level of yearly maintenance to keep streets from falling into that category. Okay, Alan. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, you know, this whole uh, reason we're having this meeting is because when we built the original road bond uh, fund 
uh, and the way we set it up is we, we wanted to make really clear promises and then make sure that we kept them. So having the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the accounting firm send us a letter, which they did, that says we spent it the way we said we were going to, and having the citizen group say that, that we spent it the way we were going to, that we were supposed to, said we were going to, uh, is that promises kept, or promises made, promises kept. So hats off to the city uh, staff for doing that. It's actually great uh, work. And I think that's why I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think each successive year, the road bond actually goes up in percentage when it gets reapproved. Um, originally our, 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 slow, our campaign was, uh, uh, drive around if you don't believe that we need this. Um, and that worked. Um, I wanted to thank the folks on the committee for serving on this, that they've done yeoman's work. Um, and I wanted to compliment the city of Eugene and the contractors for the work that they've done. Some of the projects that I go on, well, I used to every day on Ballard and sometimes on 19th, the quality of the work is just really high. And I think that that's really shows well for our community and the greenhouse gas impacts are lower because of the warm asphalt instead of hot asphalt, which is an innovation that city of Eugene created and hopefully will take off nationally and is being done all over the Northwest now. Um, to, to Chris's point, yes, we only did a part of the fix. Uh, one of my favorite ideas was because the bigger trucks cause the greater amount of damage, the ones that go on our city streets or residential streets all the time are the garbage trucks. There's a direct nexus between the damage caused by those large heavy trucks and our, our, our un, and what's happening to the streets. So having it, we were, the proposal was $1 per can or $1 per household for everybody who has garbage service that would go towards this maintenance side. Uh, as well as a transportation user fee to based on parking to be able to meet that gap. We still have not fixed that problem. We just keep kicking the can down the road, as Chris said. But And I think that's something we need to come back to because uh, we're building nice roads, but we're not going to be able to maintain them. I do love that we went from a $280 million backlog to an $80 million backlog. That's exactly what we're supposed to do with the bond. Uh, and, and so that's worked tremendously. And I think these reports verify that. Um, but I do, one of the things about spending money on these projects is that they are a great recovery project in the near term. So we have this list for 2020 projects. Is there a way to accelerate other projects to pull them into 2020? Or is it the way that we created the bond uh, such that we can't do that? Well, the one of the challenges is the program as a whole. So we have taken kind of a complete streets approach to building these streets so that when we get in there to do the work, we work really hard with our utility partners in town. We evaluate underlying infrastructure. We look at the ADA needs. We look at the possibility of, you know, improved bike infrastructure. We often have public engagement. So because we've set up this really great system that gives us a really complete street and a really great job when we're done, it takes time. Um, so one of the one of the ways that we're having to deal with the shift is shifting things forward. Now we have been able to move at least one project that we had scheduled from for 2022, move it up to 2021, but that's really only one project worth. Um, the others, it's just, it's very difficult for us to deliver the high quality of project that encompasses all of those things to be the most um, resourceful with our funds and responsible with our funds. Um, in a shorter amount of time. It just, it takes a long time to do these projects. Mayor, if I could have just 10 seconds, if there's a way to do that and speed up that process so we can get things accelerated and move them up into a time when we're in a crisis about the economy, that would be very much appreciated. So I appreciate looking at that and seeing if we can do that acceleration of projects and moving them to, to the left on the time scale. Thanks. Emily. Thank you. Um, I'm, as before, really excited about the warm mix asphalt and that we grind up the, the sub road and we use it again. Uh, that's really reassuring. I mean, that's something for sustainability and the climate that we're doing all the time with these projects. And thank you for that. I'm wondering if you would just talk a little bit about the the bike projects and how uh, the money wasn't spent uh, and was put off. I, I think that public um, 
is often clamoring for more. I know I am bike projects, especially mm -hmm. the protected ones. So um, can you just give us, you know, what happened that we didn't get it this year? And sure. as soon um, as the money just moves forward. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to speak to it. So we did, we included some active transportation funds and I think four of our projects this year for specific things. But the West Bank path, like I said, is the first that's standalone. And when we included the million dollars a year, really it was a million dollars a year on average. And we know it's from the last bond measure, there was several years where we overspent the active transportation budget significantly, but then it evened out the next year because we spent a lot less. Um, we're doing a lot of work on the West Bank path. Um, it's proposed to collaborate with some park, park bond money as well to include in that rehab. Um, so we wanna make sure that we get it right. And it is very close to advertisement. So that project should be seen fairly soon. Um, but we also have a kind of a list and an ongoing schedule of what we anticipate being the major projects, the standalone projects from here till the conclusion of the bond as well. Thank you for that. I know that we have a long list, but I also know people, you know, want some people want the bike projects moved up. So I just wanted it to be clear that we hadn't lost anything. Right. So thank you for Not that. Lost. Yeah. Good job. Okay, it looks like I have Mike for a second round. Thank you, Mayor. I want to agree with my colleagues that uh, road maintenance projects are a good way to put people to work who need it badly at this time. And uh, I, I'd support that. Um, and Katie, you did a great job, but let me come at this from a different angle now because of what my colleagues have said. It seems they're making the case, Chris and Alan, that we're not doing the job adequately to maintain our roads at the at the funding level we have for maintenance versus the use of those roads. So my question is, I suppose then comparatively to other communities our size in the Western United States, do we have higher use lane mile or do we have considerably less money? I cannot speak to the details of other communities. Um, I would say that we're drastically better than some communities and we're not as much as other communities. I think maybe Jennifer wants to chime in and add. <laughs> <laughs> How can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> you had that excited look on your face when you popped in there. Hi, so I'm Jennifer Wooler. I'm the acting city engineer for Public Works Engineering. And um, I think one thing is that, that might be kind of confusing a little bit to Katie is I think we're mixing the words maintenance and preservation. So when Katie was talking about uh, the, the gap in funding for annual needs, she, she was talking about preservation, which we call capital preservation, which is doing those like overlays and inlays that um, can only be done like for two inches of replacing the sure. surface and then the road extends for another 20 years. Sure. Um, typically when we talk about maintenance, we're thinking about crack sealing, and um, those kind of things that just keep the road tight um, on a regular basis. And I think that um, overall we're balancing all of that out. I think one of the things that when you think about the use of the road and how does that impact the quality or how long the surface lasts, um, in a very high level general sense, passenger vehicles do very little damage to the roadway. Um, in fact, when we're thinking about how do we design a street for how thick the pavement is, we don't even count the passenger vehicles in that calculation. I mean, just as engineers on the profession of how you calculate street pavement structure. So really it goes back to what one of the counselors was saying earlier, we're thinking about garbage trucks and buses and right. just those really large vehicles that those are the ones that we design our pavements to hold up to. And so um, Eugene has a really, um, I think, progressive perspective on how we design our pavements and that we design them for those large vehicles so that we can um, do lesser treatments um, and still get a longer life out of those pavements. So in some ways, I think we're, actually ahead of a lot of other agencies around the country in that we design for what we call a longer life or, or even like perpetual life type pavement. I absolutely agree with you. I, I laud the staff. They've done an amazing job. 
I think we get more bang for the buck than almost anybody. I think that we've done an excellent job with some of the things that Emily mentioned too, with regard to us being innovative. That wasn't my question though. My question was, do we have heavier use or not by lane miles of heavy vehicles? Or do we have significantly less money per mile? Because they're making the argument, my colleagues, that we need a new source of revenue in order to be able to adequately maintain our roads. So I'm asking simply, is that because we get more traffic on them or because we have considerably less money than them? Yeah, so I'll pro we'll probably have to follow up and kind of do a survey across kind of how other agencies are funded. Um, dollar per mile. Um, but I think one of the things that we're really still struggling with here is just that we did have a long period of time that we let that backlog get so big sure. that it's something that it just, um, without like a huge lottery influx again, of cash I, to deal I with. I apologize it. for the interruption. Yeah, yeah. Again, though, we're not talking about the backlog. We're sure. talking about the deficit in maintenance. That was clearly defined, and I'm asking about the deficit in maintenance, okay? Right, so the the graph that Katie brought up with it was a how much money are we getting each year to spend on preservation? And it's a combination of the bond and our local gas tax. Right. And it just doesn't, it's not enough money to address um, how the streets, how that backlog continues to grow. So streets that fall, that deteriorate into the need that they need to be rehabbed or they deteriorate to the point that they need to be reconstructed. Right. I think I and understand the question, we're, we're Mike. Lo we're losing that battle because. Well, right. I think we're gonna need to follow up on, on this because you're, you're asking questions around comparators, city to city to city. Right. which will be a little bit of a challenge just because we don't all build our roads to the same standard. But I think getting sure. a rough idea of where do we stand in terms of revenue to lane mile uh, as a well, comparator is something we can look at. Well, and the reason I asked that question is because we've made a decision as a community. Well, we've made a decision as a council that we're going to build more densely. We're going to put more impacts on our few roads with intention. We're going to build densely and focus on not building greater capacity. And thus that decision has a cost. And I'm asking essentially, is that decision's cost what we're dealing with in this discussion right now? Got it. Thank you. Alan. Yeah, I would say it's it's not. This is this is this is not a new problem. This is the same exact problem we had in 2007, which was there's two pots of money, one for capital construction, building roads, and one for maintaining the roads. Both were insufficient. The, the capital budget for building roads was so insufficient that we were building this backlog that we were gonna never get out from underneath. And that's why we did the road bond. We increased the gas tax to help with the maintenance of the streets. Both of those were insufficient to get to zero over time, but we made compromises. We still have, and, and in 2007, this problem had been going on for years before we started tackling it in 2007. 2007 is when we started to tackle it. It was a decade, two decade old problem before that. So we still have that exact same problem. We do not have and never have had in the last in memory of most people living enough money in our maintenance funds to to maintain the roads that we have. It has nothing to do with density, how much we use the roads. It's just a pure cash flow problem that when we have two pots of money and they can't be intermixed, we have to use the maintenance money for maintenance and the capital for building roads or preservation. And, and we still do not have enough money to maintain the roads over the long term. And, and, and in part, that's why our backlog doesn't go down as fast. So, um, so I don't think that that's the right question. And when we, I, if I remember correctly, Chris, and you can shake your head when we looked at try to compare ourselves to other cities that didn't work because it was so apples and oranges, but we can get there uh, potentially. Um, the question, I, another question I had was, uh, Jennifer, with one end, uh, you 
mentioned, or I guess Katie, you you were talking about it. Maybe Jennifer was talking about it. Um, that the uh, that we choose different kinds of materials for different kinds of streets depending on what they are. Wh when do we choose to do asphalt? When do we choose to do concrete? Because my understanding was concrete if it's really heavily used. The one on 19th in front of Matt Matthew Knight Arena, I. I thought that was going to be able to use all the trucks and the big things that that should have been concrete, but then the big asphalt, I mean, a Villard, sorry. Um, so I, that's, I would like a little bit of guidance of when we choose to do what. And Jennifer, I'm going to let you go ahead and answer that. So you're right, Councillor Zelenka, that it is an engineering decision that we look at what is the use of the vehicles on the street and, um, the, the one on Villard, when we went through and did the traffic counts and looked at the vehicles that use Matthew Knight Arena, we found that we could do a really thick asphalt pavement with the idea that, you know, if it does, it's designed so it will fail from the top and we can theoretically do an overlay or an inlay in the next 20 years or so, and that the life cycle cost is such that that is a better value for that money. But then there's some streets, um, because in the, in reality, Villard really is a local neighborhood street, except for that one section gets more right. heavy use, but otherwise the traffic trucks. count still is very similar to a local street, even the heavy vehicles. Um, but say like a street like South Willamette, we're putting that back in concrete because when you look at the heavy vehicle use, we do see a lot of, you know, transit and garbage and heavy trucks that are delivering things to the stores and taking stuff across town. So, so we've really tried to make that be an engineering decision that's based on what is the percentage of heavy vehicles on the street and what is that life cycle cost? So um, how often would we have to rehab an asphalt street if its surface got hit with that much heavy traffic? And how much would we have to rehab a concrete street if it were? And, and right. how long would those be expected to last? Exactly. So I'm, I'm gonna just jump in here and Thanks. try to wrap this. Thank you. I'm gonna try Thank and wrap up because I know that in this format that Jessica needs time to queue up the public forum piece of it. So I, um, it, Chris, I have you, did you need to make one very quick comment? Because otherwise I think we need to. I was just going to say, and maybe as a frame of reference, I can remember probably 12 or 13 years ago, I was invited into a public works meeting in the city of Springfield where they were having this exact same conversation and they were looking at exactly the same issues, backlog and maintenance. So it's not a thing that's unique to Eugene or the level of traffic. They had exactly the same problem and they and the scale was actually pretty close. Okay, thank you. Uh, clearly this is a compelling topic for us. It's all about roads. Thank you so much for a really good uh, discussion. We all could say more, but I think we have to close this meeting out so the next meeting can get queued up. So thank you all very much and we'll be back at 7.30.